and get started. Welcome everyone. Come on in. Find a seat. Great. My name is Baron Schwartz. This is Brian Cantrell. He's the uh, VP of Engineering at Joyent. He's also a Sun Distinguished uh, Sun Microsystems Distinguished Engineer and one of the creators of DTrace. He builds the smart OS and smart data center platforms at Joyent. Next in line is Robert Treat. He's the Chief Database Architect at Omni TI, and he leads a team of other database architects there. He's recognized as a major contributor to PostgreSQL, and he's a published author. Kate Matsudera is the VP of Engineering at um, SEO Moz. She formerly worked at Amazon, Microsoft, and Sun Microsystems. Um, Philip Wickline is the CTO at Hadapt, a company that's building a data analytics platform on top of Hadoop. And he's formerly from Endeka. And then last in line, but not least, of course, is John Hug, senior software engineer at um, VoltDB. And he was VoltDB's first software engineer. So everyone, uh, make yourselves comfortable. What we're going to be talking about tonight is taking big data to the cloud. Two topics there, big data, cloud. And what I want to do is focus on three sort of dimensions of that in this panel. What do these things mean? Where are they going? And what's the value? And I, I'm talking more right now than I'm going to be talking the rest of the time. I'm probably just going to be uh, letting everyone else weigh in on their opinions, and I'll, I'll be sitting back and watching the show. So let's go ahead and get started with the, the big data part of things. And uh, John, on the end, maybe you can tell us what big data means. Uh, well, I, I think, it, you know, I, I like to think of big data a little bit like obscenity. You kind of, you know it when you see it, but it's a, it's a very difficult thing to define. Um, but, but I do, I do subscribe to the kind of the view of the, the three V's of big data. There's, there's the velocity component, the, the, the variety component, and the volume component. And that, that kind of most of these big data problems have at least one of those that, that is really uh, straining kind of existing systems that were, weren't built to handle that kind of. So sort of three dimensions of big data that matter. I mean, I don't want to tell anybody you don't have a big data problem or you do have a big data problem. But, but it, in, in that sense, I think that those three dimensions, either it's too fast, it's too large, or too, too all over the place uh, you know, to, to manage in, in kind of the way you used to manage things 10, 15 years ago. Philip, are there, uh, are there sort of thresholds where these things become too big, too fast, or, or too diverse? Is it, are there any uh, cutoff points? You mean where, where it's no longer big because it's too big data? <laughs> or, you know, is, is 100 megabytes big for some people while for other people they would, right. they would sneeze at anything less than a terabyte? Yeah, well, you know, I think that, uh, you know, it all depends upon the context and what you're trying to do. Um, you know, I, I you know, for, for sort of straightforward analytics where you're not dealing with much uh, velocity of change, data that's changing as quickly, you know, then you're thinking about, you know, terabytes and terabytes, tens and hundreds of terabytes to be big. But, you know, if you're working in more of a transactional system and so forth, if you have the throughput that you're dealing with can, can mean much smaller volumes of data become really big in terms of the kind of complexity and the kind of systems that you need to deal with it. I mean, a lot of what makes big data big is that you need big systems to deal with it, big in terms of number of nodes or number of, uh, you know, compute resources you're throwing at it. So all of those, all of the, the dimensions that he mentioned are, are, you know, perfectly valid ways to get to big. So is another way to say that it's inconvenient? Yeah, well, except it, it needs to be extremely inconvenient, right? I mean, I think that if it's inconvenient, but, you know, I can deal with it with a with a couple of smart engineers in a small system, then that's not really big. It's, it's when it, you need to bring in the best people and large amounts of uh, uh, computing resources, you know, I.O. resources, whatever it is to deal with it. Now you're talking big. And just out of curiosity, and, and not as a product plug, but um, how big are you looking at targeting Hadapt? Um, you know, so the, the Hadapt ambition is, is uh, you know, to continue scaling as the cloud scales, to continue scaling as Hadoop scales and so forth. So, you know, there isn't really an upper bound on that in terms of our ambitions. Um, but, you know, we're, you know, when we look at systems that are below, you know, many terabytes, we, we kind of start to think, well, those are kind of small problems. Um, and we're certainly dealing with things, you know, in the tens and hundreds of terabytes. And, you know, uh, I think we're, we're an early company and, and we're, we're growing, but, you know, into the petite, petite scale and beyond is certainly applicable. Yeah. Kate? Um, 
Uh, well, I agree with what these guys said. I think it just depends, again, on the context of your situation. I probably don't have a lot to add to other than what they've said. Petabytes, terabytes, it's big. But gigabytes can be big in a certain system. We're too agreeable. I know. We really need to fight. Brian okay. said he was going to fight. Yeah. Robert is, Brian hasn't talked yet. Oh, don't worry. The fighting's coming. The fight's coming. Okay, it's coming. Right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I guess the, the, the difference that I would say, like, if, if Artur was up here, he'd say that if your problem can be solved by SSDs, then... It's not big. Right, it's yeah. not... Well, you don't have a big data problem, I guess I would say. And, and SSDs now, right, you can buy five terabyte SSDs. So I'm not saying they're cheap, but um, you probably need to be somewhere above that range to have a big data problem. Right. Otherwise, you maybe have big data, or maybe you have data problems, but I guess they're probably not big data problems. Yeah. Unless you're dealing with mobile, things yeah. big can be. Robert, what kinds of examples Just have you personally <laughs> worked with? Um, so, I mean, most of the the big data that we have worked on, I mean, it's probably in the terabyte range, uh, multiple terabyte range, I guess, um, but not hundreds of terabytes. Right, and we're trying to scale, I guess, what would now be considered old school analytical stuff, right? Like relational databases doing OLAP and that kind of thing and pushing that uh, and making those systems work. So that actually is a pretty well, uh, I think somebody used the term like a well-trodden but, but not necessarily easy path. Uh, and I think that that's the case you know, in relational systems and doing that level of data. Uh, if, if and when you get to the cloud, it sort of throws all that on its head, so. Uh, it becomes a different thing. Don't nod your head. No, I, I agree. You're trying to lure me in with no, the fight, I, 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 It's a trap. Actually. Okay. No, all no, right. You don't have anything to disagree with. Brian? I actually no, I actually don't. I, I think that it's. I mean, all the stuff seems reasonable. Of course, it's not very specific, so it's easy to be reasonable. But the um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I guess the. And I'm, I'm, I'm a cloud guy, I guess, not a data guy. Um, but one question I definitely have is around big data. Is it, it seems to me that that um, we are a solution in search of a problem and that people are, there's a lot of data that's being kept that I kind of wonder, is this actually even possibly valuable? I mean, are we, uh, is big data always dumb data? I mean, should we actually be doing more processing in situ? Um, and again, that's a question, not an assertion. So I, maybe it's a disagreeable question, but I'm actually not trying to be disagreeable. Um, can we be doing more processing in situ so it never actually hits the spindle and has to be pulled back off? I, you can definitely give yourself a big data problem. Right, like if you don't want to buy the five terabyte SSD and you want to do it, you know, on Amazon or on commodity hardware, then hey, now you have a big data problem. Now you get to use Hadoop, uh, Hadapt or Hadoop or whatever. I mean, any of those, right? So, uh, I, I would say you can make yourself a big data problem if you don't have one to begin with. I Kate, think it looks like you've made yourself some that. big data problems. Oh, um, well, I mean, we for those who don't know, I work on a company that we build a web index and we're always crawling the web and competing. So it's kind of like a mini Google, but we do it in the cloud. Um, we also have the luxury of we don't do full text, and so we have a lot of really interesting stuff, but a lot of the queries against our API are really looking for a needle in the haystack. So we wish we could throw away pieces of it, but like we can't, right? But we do throw it away. I mean, we're crawling all the time, so every two weeks we throw away all the old data. So we're constantly deleting 12, 20 terabytes at, or, at a time. Yeah. I think if you look at the, you know, if, to come back to your question, could we deal with it in situ and so forth? I think that's actually been, you know, if you look at sort of the world we come from often, which is sort of more of a traditional data warehousing, you know, large scale analytics. You know, if you look at sort of the way data warehousing systems were built in the past, it said, you know, we, we can store all of your data as long as it's structured in, in a certain kind of form. And as long as you want to figure out ahead of time what sort of questions you're going to ask of it. I mean, one of the interesting things about the possibilities of big data today is that's, all, that's always been a really hard starting point because it says you have to know in the future what you're going to want from this stuff. Uh, you know, what you're going to want in the future, you have to know that now. So you know, one, of the, one of the things people are doing with big data is you know, let's start by archiving and put the processing power near that so we can figure as we get the questions, as the world changes, we need to know more about it. We're actually able to ask those questions later on. I, I guess my counter question would be, but if you're throwing away the data that's old, that's 12 terabytes old, if there's a time, or that, that's two weeks old, there's a timeliness to the data, and you want to change your query, you just change your query, do you need to always run it against historical data? I mean, I, so one of the ways that data gets big, though, is that you save the historical data, right? I mean, you know, I've worked both with, with, with uh, uh, Hadapt and also with Endeka before, you know, companies that are looking at the history that can span many years and they're looking for really interesting patterns and occurrences that have happened to them, you know, whether that's in sales transactions or whether it's in, you know, document archives, emails, those sorts of things. So, 
Uh, you're not always throwing away the data. Sometimes it's exactly the fact that you want to go back in time and, and understand what's happened to you that, that makes your data big. So this is the volume versus the velocity. Well, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm not speaking from personal experience, but there was an interview with some of the uh, Zynga folks who, who mm -hmm. produced Farmville and a bunch sure. of these flash games. And a lot and of data. They, they, they uh, had traditionally thrown away a lot of data after a certain amount of time. And one of the things they said is that for the first month that we launch a game, we, we now will not throw out anything. Um, so they're still looking at ways that they can prune this data so they don't end up with these petabytes of information. But for the first month, they say that we don't know the kind of questions we're going to want to ask about that when we're launching our next game, you know, three or four months from now or a year from now. So we, we don't, they can't go back and say the first month of Farmville, what did that look like? Uh, they only have kind of the aggregate statistics that they kept a lot around. Mm -hmm. So that's not necessarily a case of somebody saying, I want to keep all data forever. But it's that you know certain windows. I don't know. I won't don't know what I'm going to want to be able to ask, and, and keeping all that information is useful. So as guys who sell products to solve that problem, um, why do we have to convince everyone to store that in an actual analytic system, right? Why not just keep everything in a log file, and then when you know the data that you want to go look at, load that into a system and then query on it? Then you don't have a big data problem, right? You have like a storage in S3, and then a loaded into your system problem. Mm -hmm. right. One well, of the things I wanted to ask is how is the uh, we were talking about volume and variety earlier. How is this different from your typical OLTP or OLAP um, uh, types of data? What are sort of the qualitative differences? So are you suggesting that the OLTP, OLAP, those don't apply in the big data world? I mean, I think that it's, it's, those are, those are sort of the same metaphors still exist. I mean, if you look at Volt, they're looking at, you know, what is the OLTP problem, but at a, you know, at a much larger scale or with greater velocity and so forth. Or if you look like what, you know, we're doing at Adapt, it's, it's very much like the, it is the OLAP problem, but again, at a much larger scale than it's traditionally been handled. So it's, it's those problems just bigger, harder. Yeah, I think Moore's Law is keeping up with the OLTP problem, <laughs> right? So that's yeah. why you don't see as much of it there. Uh, whereas with doing data analytics, like now we've gone crazy and we do store everything forever. So in that case, you, you've got to have something different. Sometimes you hear people talk about the, uh, the big data being loosely structured, for example, um, and needing to be processed in ways that are, that, uh, are good at dealing with loosely structured data. So um, Kate, you probably have loosely structured data. Yeah, I mean, well, we, we have a lot of different things. So we kind of keep archival ones that are flat that we can regenerate from our crawls and then we'll we also then create certain views for our API in lots of sorts, right? Because even if you're querying for a needle in a haystack, if it's not sorted in the right way, you're not going to find it. So our data is not as loosely structured as you might imagine. But yeah, I mean, at some level, yes, when you're crawling the web, everything's kind of loose. It's hard to put context around or you know, frameworks on every web page and stuff. But. I think we have to impose some structure on the data to make some sense out of it. And going back to an earlier comment, we don't know what kinds of questions we're going to ask, so we keep the, keep the data for a long time. We may impose a different structure on it in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the Hadoop world, one of the most common things people are doing in Hadoop is they're taking some large log structured or unstructured or semi-structured data source, and you say you have to impose some structure on it. One of the first things that people are doing is often taking that large raw uh, you know, corpus, and then extracting interesting things out of it, which then they often then end up storing in some more structured system and asking further queries on that. But keeping having the source data to go back to is is a really valuable thing for many people. Whereas, um, for those of you who were here in this presentation just before mine, we saw uh, Brian and his colleague demonstrating heat maps, which were undoubtedly generated from large amounts of data that you were analyzing in situ and then throwing away, right? So you're yeah, I mean, you're you're right. modest amounts of data, but yeah, we were we and we were not we don't keep that data because we don't actually want to have a big data problem. Now, yeah. um, it may well be that it's like that data is in you know many of the questions. It's like well, that data is very interesting, but there's a lot of interesting data you could go gather. I think it's it, it obviously depends on the nature of the data about whether you, you can can you afford to keep everything. It's like you you can't, you're actually even Zynga is not actually keeping everything. There's sure. information that is being discarded implicitly that they don't. Yeah. They're not even aware of, yep. and you know, at where do you draw those lines? I think it's a you know it's a challenge, and, the, and then the, the storage I think becomes a challenge, especially when you're cloud board. So you just mentioned a couple of the challenges, um, John. What would you say are a couple of the other challenges? We've also heard about the uh, the anal analytical edge of uh, the challenge, storage. What other kinds of challenges are we actually trying to solve with these big data systems? Well, I think that. Um 
that, uh, that one of the more interesting challenges is when you look at interoperability between systems and you look mm -hmm. at the data you have, um, you know, certainly you can just dump that data into Hadoop and perform these, you know, MapReduce queries at perhaps, you know, a thousand times less efficient than, than more purpose-built solutions. Mm -hmm. But that, I mean, that's something that a lot of people do. But when you say, I have this data and maybe the right way to ask this question is in this system or the right way to ask this question is in this system or perhaps I have a path of data that moves through different systems as I'm collecting it, perhaps they're filtering, throwing things away, um, deciding what happens. Um, just the integration of these things, in, in terms of when nothing is failing, even moving a lot of data around can be really tricky, especially in the cloud. Um, and when things start failing and you say, okay, well, you know, this amount of data that's five terabytes is out of sync with this amount of data that's seven terabytes, and rectifying this is gonna take longer than I have uh, time to deal with. I think that's a really big challenge when you have so much data is, is simply moving it around is expensive uh, and, and getting it to the kind of, getting it to where you want in terms of systems, getting systems to play together. Even if the data is very unstructured, a lot of that requires a lot of planning and, and preparation. I think perf and velocity are also two really big problems, right? So like crawling the web, you're pulling in petabytes of data and you have to process it really, really quickly, otherwise you're wasting resources or even accessing all this data or even if you do shove a whole bunch of stuff into Hadoop, making that a positive ROI for the process that you're running on the data, I think is another interesting challenge. So just just because you can do it and you have the resources, like making that actually cost efficient, I think is a big challenge, from my perspective anyway. Robert? Yep. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Not contentious enough? Um. We should eat, we can eat donuts. <laughs> Let them all just We agree, agree. eat donuts. <laughs> okay. So um, what's different about this than historically? I mean, we talk a lot about big data today, but we know that there are examples of people who have been dealing with what we would certainly currently call big data for a very long time, Walmart, for example. They have had a very large data warehouse for a very long time. What's new? Uh, Brian. Well, I mean, I think that the, the cloud element is obviously it, it's a new element to it. I think that, you know, you've got different kinds of data. I think that you, you look at data that like a Zynga is generating, for example, and it's this kind of data trail coming off of the application, right? As opposed, so it's not data that you're pulling off the web or an external resource or, uh, or a device in the case of, a, of, of, of big science data, but you're, you're actually generating as an artifact of your running system. And the problem is that when that running system is in the cloud, well, your data is in the cloud now, whether you wanted it to be or not. Um, and now I think you've got a challenge about how you actually go process that efficiently. Uh, and I, I mean, I think that there are, there are several technical challenges there. Um, one of the technical challenges I say is that you, you need to have local storage. Uh, you need to keep that storage close to that compute. Um, and you know, we, we are um, kind of steadfast believers that you can't, you don't want to over centralize storage um, because especially as you go to do big analytics on it, the, the disk does not deal well with multi-tenancy. Right. So you, you, you've got to, I think you've got to push that data out and you've got to keep it. Just what you guys were describing in terms of you're going to process that data and you're, you're, going, to, you're going to iterate over it and maybe structure it a little bit better and then yep. feed it up to a different system. Mm -hmm. um, but where that data is generated needs to be local store. And, and that's new. Yeah. Well, I think we, we, that, we, what's new is that, the, that we're all being economically moved to the cloud, whether we like it or not. I mean, the, 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 the economic benefits of the cloud are simply too great for too many people. So I think that that's going to be, and maybe, that's, maybe we can finally get to the fist fight that, that the crowd so clearly <laughs> thirsts for. Well, I also think it's um, cost, right? So I don't know about most people, but when I was managing a budget five years ago, a terabyte was a lot more than it is now. What right? You can store a terabyte for under 200 bucks in Amazon a month. Like, that was not at the same financial reason. And just that allows you to do more problems and like imagine, you know, bigger things to do that you couldn't do before. That is true, but the bandwidth hasn't actually changed coming off the spindle. No, um, that's true. The, 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 well, and, but and, maybe and, the time is the same. And the, the head latency hasn't changed. So you've got to be smarter about the way you use that terabyte, right? That's true, Absolutely. but at least you can even contemplate having a terabyte right. of data, yeah, right? right? Yeah. But as a startup before, you know, you can't spend 10 grand or whatever it was just five years ago. So I think that's been huge in just in terms of innovation. Yeah, I think that that's one of the, you know, definitely what you were saying about the, 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 the source of the data and the, is, is changing as, as we move to the cloud or as we get more, we actually collect more information such as clicks instead of just purchases. Um, but another big big difference is that the, the kind of companies that want to deal with these big data problems, I mean, you mentioned Walmart, um, but certainly you know, big banks have been dealing with these things. All these companies have lots of money. 
Um, and I think one of the things that's changing, not just from the cloud, but also from Moore's Law and economies of scale and some of the software that's out there to, to deal with these problems is it's opening up these problems to companies on a shoestring budget. I mean, I know where I work, people call us, mm -hmm. they're, they're startups, they're a couple person shops, and they say, you know, I want to do this impossible task five years ago. And, and you know, that's something, you know, that, that now is achievable for them for lots of reasons, certainly not just our software. Well, that, um, that really just change, changes the game in terms of the advantage they can get from that. The cloud gives economies of scale to startups and smaller companies, right? Because I think that's exactly how it leverages into your point. Yeah, when you, and you can also, you, you can scale up your utilization of resources as you need to scale your problem. And, and then get rid of them when you don't want them. Right. right. But I think that you, we've been focusing a lot upon what's enabled people to do, deal with big data problems. But I think there actually are a lot more big data problems than there were even you know, 5, 10, 20 years ago. And, and the reason is you know, that, that so much of human activity has moved online. So much of human activity has become digitized. You know, there's a lot of big data that's, that's uh, you know, logs of machines and so forth. And people talk about machine-generated data. But ultimately, all interesting data actually starts with human beings. If those are machines that you're getting logs off of, they're machines that are doing something in the service of humans at some point. So you know, as human activity has become you know, digitally processed, that volume has just skyrocketed. And obviously there's derivative data, it's the machine data on the human data, but all of that has, that's really growing rapidly. So it's simultaneously we have, you know, bigger disks, we're able to store this stuff, we have cloud possibilities to get more resources that we can, you know, more uh, flexibly add and remove from the problem. But a lot of it is that there's so much more data that we can actually learn from and do things with and profit from. Uh, that's the other side of the big data equation, why you know, there's the hype that there is now and why there's this growing attention. Do the general public actually understand that? Do they understand that solar panels, for example, send streams of data back to the companies that are managing them? Usually the conspiracy theorists don't know something about it, right? There's, there's always somebody who's, who's sure that you know, this or that device is, is uh, uh, watching them. I mean, you know, my personal take on that is uh, you know, there is a lot of data being generated about all sorts of things. Uh, the one reason that I'm not particularly worried about, uh, uh, you know, the big brother implications of that are is simply, you know, gross incompetence, right? The, the difficulty it would, it would, there would be to actually gather those things and put the, put the, uh, put all of that together. Though, of course, you know, a lot of the ad tech people are doing a pretty good job of that. So, That's true. you know, there, there's, there's. It's <laughs> just that, cookie brokers who broker cookies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, there are there are some surprising, but I, I tend to think actually a lot of that intelligence is, is in the ad tech people and not necessarily in Big Brother, but. <laughs> but who knows, right? I, I, don't, I think a lot of people have suspicions about what's out there, but don't know. Do we have new ethical challenges or questions that we need to, to address because of the ability to process and, and analyze large quantities of data that were just infeasible before, Robert? Uh, I don't think the challenges are new. I think they apply to more people, right? Um, it's not that, I mean, the, like the credit bureau companies have been around for decades now. Right, and they know far more stuff than you want them to know about you, uh, but they've had the money and the capabilities to do this stuff. Right, so the question of how much data should they keep and how much analytics and who do they share that with, that ethical challenge has always been there. Uh, now it's just that you know, half the people in this room can do the same thing. Uh, and, and so the questions aren't different, but definitely you're gonna get more people with you know, falling on different parts of the line of, as to where that line should be drawn. So um, I, it's, it's something to be aware of, but I don't think it's entirely new. There certainly seems to be some of these companies are, are, are catching on to not just the value to their organization, but the value of that data. And I mean, cer certainly Facebook and Google are very interested in knowing lots about you in order to sell to advertisers. But I think people who are accidentally sitting on that data as part of another business are realizing, ah, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years, but it turns out I know a whole lot about these people, and that's valuable from, a, from an advertising from a standpoint. So you see people like credit card companies who may not, their, the data that they have is tremendously valuable, but they, they're credit card companies. They're trying to get you to you know, use credit cards. They're not trying to sell you, you know, other things. They're not trying to, to do, you know, that has traditionally been a different problem. But now you see things like a lot of collaboration between these companies and other and things saying, you know, well, I've got this Amazon card or, or I've got this JetBlue card, and it's a collaboration between, you know, JetBlue now knows where I'm purchasing things. And th that's, I think, 
not you know a little bit different than it has been. Credit cards are a clear example. But have we seen or will we see a secondary market for anonymized data where the, the a company realizes you know we've monetized this the best we can, but we actually this data is actually quite valuable and it doesn't there. violate our policies that we've to, to actually resell it. There are why, companies why that do nothing yeah. but that. Yeah. There's like three there, there's, those markets exist where we don't see them already, um, and and yeah. I'm sure they're going to be more visible in the future, but. And there's already people selling people's data has been sort of a long time thing. This, this was a pivot this week. I think there was a lot of news in Congress too about uh, OnStar, the, the company that, yep. that allows you to dial in on your car uh, to get help. And has, it has a GPS and a cell phone built in. And they are having trouble, I think, for their, from their primary business model, but also realizing that they happen to know where all of these cars are driving all of the time and change their terms of service so that they could monitor and sell that information even after you canceled your subscription. Uh, they took a little flack for this, which you know, luckily someone read the terms of service and said, wait, wait, wait. But, uh, but that's an example of a business model that, that had nothing to do with selling your data, that someone realized, wow, this is incredibly valuable. What other value is uh, emerging from the phenomenon of big data? Those guys on the end are, the in theory, making lots of money on it. Yeah, that's, that's, right. that's right. The value, no. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear the question. What's the value? So, so what emerging values are we discovering that we didn't understand before we could get from this kind of data? Maybe too hard of a, or too broad of a question to, question. to just yeah. kind of throw out there to the group. There's a lot so. of different things people are doing. <laughs> <laughs> Let me move on to something more specific and technical, actually. What kinds of analysis techniques um, are you seeing? Can we segment the analysis techniques the same way that we saw three different dimensions, the velocity, variety, and volume of the problem? Can we, can we come up with categories of the analysis techniques too? Um, John, because you were so great at the yeah. <laughs> three uh, dimensions of the big data problem. Well, I, I mean, I think that, you know, it, it's, there's a similar kind of thing where you've got the data that, that has temporal value, right? That, mm -hmm. that, you know, you may want to react to something happening in real time. So there's, there's, you know, real-time analytics is overused as a term, and whether people mean microseconds or minutes, people use this term a lot. But, but the idea of I want to respond to something as it's happening, um, and then certainly there's, there's the, the I've got lots of data, I want to run a slow learning process on it. So on the other, the other extreme is, you know, so that then I can rebuild my model and maybe come back at this problem, you know, next month with a much better algorithm or a much better approach to selling ads, stocks, or, or whatever it is I'm trying to monetize. Um, so certainly there's a latency difference between microseconds and, and a month that, that changes how we look at the data and the kinds of things we can do to the data. Um, it's one dimension. Um, I want to wrap up the big data section before we belabor it a little too much and uh, move on to cloud. But I just want to ask um, each of you we can all answer this question one at a time, maybe starting with Brian here. Um, how do you think this is going to change? What's the future of big data if you can look out a few years? I, you know, it's, it's very hard for me to, to see that because I'm, I'm so far beneath the way this data is actually being used. Um, I, I do think that there's going to, I mean, the things that I see is um, I, I think that there's a lot of compute being stood up right now for this analysis. I, I think that's got to get smarter. Um, I just feel yeah. that, that there's a lot of brute forcing that's going on out there. Um, so one of the things that, that I wonder, and admittedly, like, this is kind of my shtick, I guess, but it's how can we actually see the quality of that analysis? How can we understand? I mean, you've got all, the, all this compute out there. You've got, it's got storage that it's talking to. I mean, have, are those systems really balanced properly? I mean, do we, it seems to me that, that we're emitting a lot of greenhouse gases because we don't know what we're doing in terms of we, we, we're just throwing a lot of, of, of literal energy at the problem. So I, I think we're going to have to get smarter. Um, and I think that you know maybe having more of this cloud, be cloud born and and forcing people to kind of pay by the hour will force some of that intelligence. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll be more of a. I just see. I don't know if you guys see the same thing, but I see a lot of folks standing up. You know these huge clusters. It's like how did you know that was the right number of of compute nodes to stand up? That seems like a big number, Robert. So I actually wish that that would happen, but I guess I don't think that is going to happen. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the idea that people are going to think that the ultimate goal seems to be store everything forever. Right, that seems to be the path that, that people are happy to trod down. Uh, and you know, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, I mean, it's not an inherently bad idea, it's just expensive. Uh, but as those costs continue to push down, you're gonna see more people pushing in that direction. So the question really becomes, can the tools that, that we want to work with, how well will they work on those things? And I, I mean, I think they're going to keep improving. If you look at the ecosystem around Hadoop, you're seeing a lot of tools get built 
um, turning it into you know, a more general purpose solution that can be bent and, and shifted in different ways. So I, I see that just, it's gonna continue to grow and grow. Um, whether the cloud can actually keep up with that would be an interesting thing to see. Mm. Okay. So five years seems like a pretty long time, but I, I would like to think that costs are gonna go down and that people will be able to do more. And I think more faster is kind of the key part. Like for me, I, you know, if you could make better decisions now versus having to have a wait a week to get data or what have you, I don't know, I, some more applications around that, leveraging more data in real time, stuff like that. And hopefully more innovation, right? Because the thing that I love about big data and like cloud is that it allows people who didn't have access to those resources before to have resources, like a guy in his dorm room with an idea, yeah. right? And that's powerful. And so I'm really excited to see what happens in the next few years, because I think the cloud has enabled a set of things that were just no longer possible. Um, so that's my two cents. Yeah, so I actually want to echo a couple of different things that were said and kind of put a different spin on it. You know, I think, I don't know if five years is, is the time frame. It may be longer than that. I absolutely agree things have got to get smarter. You know, a lot of big data handling today is brute force scanning, you know, it, it, the, sort of the lowest common denominator possible to access that stuff. But it's a start, and there's a lot of smarter tools like, you know, some of the stuff we're working on that might help with that. Um, but, you know, ultimately, to come back to your point, it's democratization of this process. I mean, I feel like we're at a point with looking at big data that maybe the world was with simple analytics, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, where it's really in service of, you have to be an entity with a fairly large budget and a fairly high value response uh, to, to actually be able to put these things into play. I think I'd like to see us get to a point where the tools are smart enough and the costs come down enough that you have a sort of democratization that, you know, individual people or smaller entities can, can actually access this stuff to get at what they want to get at, you know, where you're, you're able to essentially make decision making uh, by individuals in, in important positions, in, in, in all sorts of positions, whether it's within the enterprise or, you know, individually be able to access large amounts of data to make smarter decisions. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with a lot of what's said going last. It's great. Um, but <laughs> I, you know, I, 10 years ago, you know, kind of when I was getting into this field, a lot of people you know, in my grad school said, well, why are you interested in databases? It seems like a solved problem. Yeah. Um, and and you know, that's changed so much now. There's just a million different companies. There's a bunch of 1.0s coming out this week. Yeah. And there's so many young companies. It almost feels like there's just this, this huge, it's like, like I don't know, like like a, like the movie X Men First Class kind of thing, where there's these people using learning to use these powers, and I think five years from now it's going to be really exciting as as these things that are 1.0 and 2.0 now are, are 5.0 and 6.0, and you've got these mature tools that not just are better individually, but are better at integrating with other systems. You know, it, it, I mean, I'm almost looking forward to the point where it's a little bit more of a a little bit more boring, where I have a problem, I go, okay, well here's how to solve it. This is this is easy, and it, I can as a business say, you know, I know how to solve this problem, I can get tremendous value, I don't have to focus on what I'm gonna do with my data as much. I don't know if that's gonna happen. Switch hopefully. gears and, and switch slides behind you. To, uh, to thematically demonstrate that we're moving to the cloud. Um, so let me start by just asking, what is the cloud, Brian? Oh, God. Uh, well, so. Um, <laughs> Come up with a really funny analogy. We need some entertainment. I, yeah, all right. I'll try to be entertaining later. Right now, I got to end. I'll leave. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, well, and I mean, you have, well, Larry Allison didn't understand it. We know that. Um, and that's the 2009 quote. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, there, there are lots of ways to think about cloud. I think there are certain attributes that have to be true in order to call it a cloud. I think you have to have multi-tenancy in order to have a cloud. If you are single tenant, um, that's not a cloud. It may feel cloudy. Um, but it, 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 is, it, is not a, it is not a cloud. And the reason it may feel cloudy is because I think there's another element that you need. You need elasticity. You need to have the ability to provision infrastructure on the fly programmatically via an API. Um, but again I, don't, again, I don't think it's so fun. Again, I do think you need to be multi-tenant because it's the multi-tenancy that unlocks the economics we're talking about. That when you've got, you know, you look at a 2U box now, a 2U box now can have a, a terabyte of DRAM. It can have, you've got two sockets of, Six core, more ten core. Uh, in the Halem, you've got you look at the, the QPI bandwidth, the PCIe Gen three bandwidth. The I mean, the, the the numbers are just off the charts. No single app can use all of that. You just can't. Maybe you can use all the DRAM. Maybe you can use all the, all the network bandwidth. Maybe you can use all the CPU. I have not seen an app that can actually make 
uh, use all of those things to do things that are meaningful. Maybe you know of, of counterexamples. Some analytical apps can do that. <laughs> I, well, no, I, I, but, 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 but I would be very surprised if you if the, if literally the system is totally balanced and that you've got the, you, you are actually pushing maximum data. I mean, it's possible, but I think that those things those systems are generally and for those cases maybe single tenant is economic. Right. But I think in general you have to have multi tenancy in order to make the system economic. That's what allows your dorm room the, mm -hmm. your dorm room occupier to go off and, and and do these things. So I think that you you need multi tenancy. You need elasticity. The other thing you need, I think, is it has to be service oriented. So, which is to say, everything needs to be available via an API. When there, whenever anything is available, and this is, you know, Amazon has done, done terrifically well at this, I think has led the way, and whenever something is made available, there's an API to go drive it. Because it, it, you need to have software-software interaction that actually deploys that infrastructure. So those, to me, are the three requirements of a cloud, and then, but of course, it's a, it's a vague enough term that um, you can disagree and not disagree. Right, so I'll, I'll put a counter example out there, Gmail. Lots of people say that Gmail is a cloud app. And I think a couple of years ago, cloud was a, a word that everybody tagged on when they were talking about Gmail, but not so much anymore. So how have we changed our understanding of cloud to move away from Gmail and Salesforce.com to be thinking about Amazon EC2 and um, platform as a service and infrastructure as a service and database as a service and software as a service rather than just Gmail? <laughs> Robert? So, so the problem is, I guess I, ref, I refute your question on, on just the, the grounds that you laid it out. Um, I think I mean, maybe this room would agree that Gmail is not the cloud, but if we go over to the hotel side of the building, most of those people think that is the cloud. Uh, and I would say if you're a person who's running your own mail server for your company, and then one day you're like, you know, if I use uh, Gmail apps, I can move my email system into the cloud, right? I just move the whole piece of infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you probably still think of that as the cloud. So I don't know, maybe there's some change. I think from an engineering standpoint, if you're building systems, you don't think of Gmail as a cloud because you don't build anything on top of Gmail, right? But if you're looking at it just from a pure business perspective, I think to them the cloud is you know, sort of any ephemeral system that I'm gonna move data into. Right? If I don't know the hard disk that my data is on, then that's probably the cloud. <laughs> kind of just to extend your definition. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if, I, if I can't point to a data center even, then that's probably whether it's Gmail or whether yeah. it's EC2. And I mean, I look at like what Brian has said, I, I, like you have to have an API. Like, like clearly we've had the cloud for a while without one. So um, it's an idea of what you want the cloud to be, but I don't think it's a requirement to be the cloud. So we're probably, um, in this room, we're probably completely dominated by people who build and create applications rather than people who use applications. So from the, the build and create side of things, uh, Kate, what would you say the definition of cloud is? Oh gosh. Um, well, I think there's like good points on all sides. Um, I definitely think that when you take some functional thing that you're doing and move it somewhere else that where someone else is doing all the management for you, in some ways that's kind of what people think of as the cloud. Um, but I definitely agree with Brian's point that if you're offering cloud services and kind of this cloud as a platform, his definition, I, when he was saying it, I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. I wasn't sure I totally agreed on the multi-tenancy thing. Um, just to be a cloud, because I think you can still. Two ways you're wrong. <laughs> I, th well, I think you can still rent machines by the hour, and that notion of time slicing it versus just slicing the hardware is still actually a really valid model, because that's actually where the economies of scale for us make sense with storage. Like the fact that we can have 40 terabytes and delete 20 terabytes and, and only pay for the time that we have both on the disk is a big economic advantage of storage in a cloud, for example. Um, so it's the time slicing more than the. The compute yeah, but, and you can view those tenants as being as being lined up in time. They're yeah. not necessarily running them in parallel. There you but, go. But, but, and so that's what I mean. But, but I, I, yeah. I need someone standing behind you who's going to use those spindles when you, when, yes. you, when you provision down, or yes. I can't offer them to you at the price that I'm offering. Exactly. And I think that's to me that's kind of the cloud as an infrastructure, which I don't know. For the sake of this forum, seems like it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, but, but does that assume that hardware costs are your base expense, right? Like I mean, if I buy a uh, system, they with, are. Well, well, well also, maybe or maybe not. If I buy a system with a large number of cores, but I can only use you know, three or four of those at a time, but I'll burst up to other ones, and I can shut things down and reduce power consumption enough right, that I can actually have a noticeable effect on my bottom line. Over time, the hardware cost is now no longer the biggest you know, the the purchasing of the hardware is not the biggest cost there. Sorry, right. by your, I thought you meant our what where our costs okay, are. I mean, right, yeah, I mean, right. obviously your costs are the the, the physical infrastructure. Uh, it depends on where you are. If you're in New York City, rent is is rent is more important than power. Rent right. is almost more important than the than the actual capex. 
yeah. to buy the gear. Um, but it's going to be rent, power, and gear. And so, yeah, those three things and are going to be the, the, the cost basis. People administrate them, right? Like you have some sort of operations associated with replacing hard drives or dealing with issues as well, right? I assume. Because that's one of the scales that we get, right? that we don't have to hire a whole fleet of sysadmins to minister, you know, administer the thousand boxes or whatever that we're using. Philip, I'm going to guess that you've been around a little bit longer than, I don't know, I'm just... Trying to, <laughs> trying to figure out who's the most senior uh, <laughs> practitioner here. But. Yeah. So uh, the funny thing about this conversation, um, we can go back to that, but you know, the funny thing about this is this is very much a technologist view of what the cloud is and what the cloud means, right? If you were to go and talk to you know, my mother or, or you know, somebody who's not a technologist who is a user of technology, to them, I don't, I don't think it's about you know, cost efficiencies or anything like that, right? I mean, to them, their mobile device is part of the cloud, right? It's a way that, it, it's that it has a connectivity to a, a virtualized world of capabilities, right? And to me, this, this comes down, to me, I think about the cloud you know, at the broadest scale. And of course, cloud is, is a very nebulous term um, that, that has, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, that, that has, <laughs> sorry, you know, it, 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 it's so broad that it becomes meaningless, like, you know, NoSQL or Web 2.0 or Tea Party. Um, you know, <laughs> in that sense, it, it, there, there's, it, 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 you know, it has so much meaning that it has no meaning. But, but, you know, to a lot of people, I think to the average person on the street, it's about, uh, it, it's about their capabilities not being serviced by a dedicated piece of hardware that's in front of them. It's about the virtualization of that capability into, into some other place so that they can get those capabilities when they need it. For the record, my mom doesn't know that the caps lock key is on and that <laughs> has no way right. of parsing even what the words were in that sentence. So for her, everything is cloud. So exactly. I, 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 don't right. know, I don't know if we want to be leading with our mother's definitions or, yeah. or my mother's definition. My mom asked me if cloud computing was using your computer on an airplane. Yeah. <laughs> no joke. So, so this this brings up a really Don't interesting you talk point. Don't talk about my mother we, like that. <laughs> no, my mom asked me that. She's like, "Oh, when you were on this panel, does that mean like when you use your computer on the airplane? Is that what you do?" <laughs> I want to be on that panel. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm just I'm starting to see that I wish this were a two-hour panel. <laughs> um, one of the things that I really want to ask before we have to wrap up is how our maturity of understanding of the cloud, what, what do you think our current level of understanding is as a profession, as IT? You know, how well do we as a group understand what the cloud is and what the uh, opportunities and values that it represents are? Philip? I think it's just beginning, right? I mean, I, I, it, like, like the handling of big data, we're at the beginning of a new era. And I think it's gonna take, you know, not five years, but, but uh, 10 years and more to really I mean, the transformation is happening, don't get me wrong, shockingly fast, right? But, you know, there's still a lot of primitive stuff that we deal with. You know, the fact that you're dealing with, you know, machine instances that are virtualized, uh, operating, to, operating system instances, operating systems, and, and the way that we think of them are, are, you know, they're so three decades ago. You know, when, when, do, when do we kind of virtualize out of that into a broader notion of cluster-based computing and so forth? We have little mini steps towards that in things like Hadoop. But, you know, it's still just just the beginning of all of that. So I, there's a long way to go yet. John, what do you think we're going to learn about the cloud, the, the unseen values? Uh, I have no idea how to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think, well, to, to, on, the, on the last point, just because just I had a better answer for that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I talked better to than a, mine? Well, no, no, better, better, better than the new question. I, I, you know, as part of my job, I talk to a lot of people who are, are using, um, you know, platform as a service or, or, or uh, kind of these uh, system services, you know, specifically Amazon's EC2, but other hosted solutions. And, and the, the differences between what some of the people you talk to know about what they're getting into and what other people you talk to know about what they're getting into is, is sometimes just dramatic. There's, there's, you know, sometimes you talk to people with a very romanticized notion of, of kind of, well, the cloud is there, and that means that I don't have to run my data center because Amazon will make this, the, you know, this perfect ethereal data center that's going to not have any issues, um, and I won't have to worry about any of that, and any of the problems that will happen, they have to worry about. And then other people come to us with very, uh, I think, more realistic notions of, you know, I I'm doing this because, you know, th this, is the, this is the operational mode that I have to be in as a startup. You were talking about a little bit about the multi-tenancy forcing you to the cloud. 
um, pe people come and they say, you know, you're going to realize that, that your performance per dollar um, on the cloud is going to be much poorer for the same amount of processing than it's going to be in your back room. And, and people make the argument, well, you throw in systems, throw in power, and throw in, you know, to, depending on what you're doing, that maybe, and depending on what you're doing, maybe not, it really depends. If you're continuously doing something for a long period of time, um, you know, you can rent a system from, from Rackspace or from SGI or some of these systems, you, or you can go to Amazon's cloud. And I think that the cloud has a lot better value proposition for some of these processes if, like you say, you need to be time slicing. You need to be growing. You need to be shrinking. You need to be doing these kinds of things. Uh, so when people come and they say, uh, you know, they, they understand that that's why they're going to this and they, they need this dynamicism, uh, they need to have the, the kind of month-to-month -month billing kind of situation, then it makes more sense. Um, or if you don't know what hardware you need too, right? Because like what if the problems that you're solving change? I mean, that's what we see right, a lot with absolutely. our business, right? Like what server we would have bought a year ago made no sense for what we're operating now. Mm -hmm. And so that flexibility of being able to change instances and, and add that is really beneficial. But I also think that the, the really interesting thing in terms of arguing about the cost of the cloud is that um, the cloud has not gotten cheaper as fast as I would like. I mean, certainly some of these systems have said, okay, well, Amazon says incoming bandwidth is now free. Um, and you know, they say that we have spot instances for some of the more, I mean, there are ways that it's gotten incrementally cheaper, but effectively they're saying you get this many EC2 units for this much per dollar, and that hasn't changed in several years. Uh, it hasn't changed dramatically. And so the cost value proposition changes to Amazon, you know, I'm speaking mostly about Amazon, but other systems right. are similar. We're adding services, we're adding integration, we're adding you know, more APIs, more monitoring. We're making the platform as a whole tremendously better every several months. It's a, it's a, it's a better system. But the cost of doing the same actual computation is, is dropping faster in, a, in a, either a hosted server or in your back room than it is dropping in the cloud. And that's it, something that- it, when I think it, and that just reflects a, an economic, a short-term economic reality. Right, is it just it, lack it, of good it, competition? It, that's just, that is absolutely lack of good competition. Yeah. And I think that what you will, ha what you will see is that in terms of, uh, uh, the, we are in the infancy to answer your question. We are in the absolute infancy of, of the cloud. Um, I think that you know the um, Pradeep Sandhu, who is the, the CTO of uh, Juniper, told me that he, their view is that the cloud is, is the biggest revolution in IT in 30 years. And at the time, I took that as being like, all right, I, I get it. Like it's a big deal. Like I think it's a big deal. All right, it's a big deal. Everyone thinks it's a big deal, and it's like you just kind of made up a number. It's fine. But after that, I was like, wait a minute. Maybe he actually meant 30 years. Like actually, maybe he meant like three times 10 years. And you're like, what happened 30 years ago? Wait, that was 1981. That was the IBM PC. And I actually do think that that there are a lot of analogies between cloud computing and the PC. Yeah. And similar, you know, to the arguments against performance and so on. If you look at the, the ramp, that it, it was only until you got the economy of scale in in really the late 80s and and going into the 90s that you had an unheard of compiler company um, in Microsoft. You had an unheard of DRAM company in Intel. And those companies were able to ride that wave. And I think that what you will see is that cloud providers will be able to buy machines that are completely uneconomical for anyone to physically buy. Um, that you, and we haven't started to see it yet, but I think you will start to see stratification and you will start to see systems that are, that are now, it's like if the most economical thing is for me to buy an entire rack at a time, well, a cloud operator can do that, but a, an individual shouldn't do that. So I think you're, what you're going to see to your arguments about the performance arguments and so on, those are classic arguments made by technologies about to be disrupted. I know because I made those arguments and I, 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 like, I lived during that fat. Um, and, and was in terms of a spark argument against x86. Like, I, 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 totally, I totally welcome this change. Like, I'm not, I'm not. Uh, you for one welcome your alien overlords? I, well, I mean, <laughs> so, so, you know, my company, you know, probably about half our customers are deployed in EC2 and the other half are deployed in back rooms. And, and you know, I understand the, diff the reasons why you would do one or the other. Um, in terms of the processing you can do per dollar today, today yep. it's yep. not, it, I mean, you say that what system uses these, these kind of things. I mean, these, these systems that are new that are designed to say, Oh, I've got 64 cores. How can I use 64 cores? We've built systems to use 64 cores, yeah. and and so uh, when you're in that that model going to the cloud, the, the economics of it are, are are tough. And I I would love to that for that not to be true. And I I agree with you. At some point, that's not going to be true. Yeah, yeah but I, I th part of that is right. Learning what the industry I think needs to learn is that the cloud is not uh, an improved version of what you're doing now. Right, it's not like you know when you go from 10 megabit to like one gig on, on Ethernet, right? It's not when you go from spinning disks to SSDs. It's not just a drop-in replacement for the things that you're doing now, and that's how most people tend to approach the cloud and, and how to solve problems, right? They look at 
what's the performance I get per dollar on my you know, servers in my data center? And if I go to the cloud, you know, how does that model map economically into the cloud? You and you're actually doing it wrong, different. looking at it that way. Yeah, right. I mean, that's the other thing that you get, right? Like geographical distribution. So we run lots of servers, and the fact that we can run them in Europe allows us to service those customers so much better. And that's really huge for us. But if we had to do that ourselves and like set up some relationship and buy hardware, or, you know, even hosting is a challenge. But being able to spin it up and down based on load, it, you have to think about your software differently to take advantage of it and to make it work. And it has to make sense for your business. Well, I mean, I, I, I can say, you know, our company, we use EC2 for testing our software. We spin up instances to do some tests. Um, we also, we have backroom machines, and we also have machines that we rent on a month-to-month -month basis from hosting providers, and we don't pay any upfront cost to add a machine to that. We just say, okay, well, I'd like to give you another X hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, if I want to rent a machine in Europe, it costs more. But it doesn't but cost... And it costs a week to provision, too, right? So It takes sometimes. a few days to... No, no, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And, and so I'm saying that the value comes from the flexibility, mm -hmm. but it, not necessarily... But the flexibility is on the, on the day scale, Right. Possibly, if your flexibility is on the month scale, um, it, you know there, there's some value in, in both. I'm not trying to be, I'm it's sort of trying to get some of the contention going. So I'm playing a little bit of, <laughs> playing but, a little bit of devil's advocate well, uh, on this system. Well, but the idea that I have to buy a machine or use EC2 seems like a false choice. There yeah. are plenty of people who will rent me a physical well, machine. Yeah, and also let's be clear here: the cloud doesn't just mean the public cloud EC2, right? The cloud, the, the private cloud in the enterprise is very much alive and real, and it's a very important part of our future, right? There will be individual entities, you know, organizations that have enough, uh, you know, aggregate computing need that it's economical for them to create their own pool of resources which they virtualize and use for many different tasks. So, Like we, Google and Facebook, right? I, they manufacture their own hardware I, I, and yeah. do similar things. Yeah, and I would argue that if you don't have, if you don't buy today, if you don't buy either direct from Taiwanese ODMs or have a mainframe, you will not actually stand up your own physical infrastructure. That if those are not true of your, of, of your organization today. So yes, the Facebooks, and obviously the Amazons and the Googles. But I, I, I think that the, the economics are, are, I think, are, you will not stand up a single rack. You will not stand up, even if what you're looking at is even 10 racks, it will not be economical to do so. I yeah, know. I, think, I think that's out of touch with reality to get to the, to, the, to the controversial part of this, right? I mean, there are lots of big Fortune 500 type companies that are standing up racks and racks and racks of machines that they're virtualizing that infrastructure and you know, putting applications on you know, virtual machines within that world and essentially time slicing those things and, you know, bo both, you know, in real time running simultaneously, but also I've got a project that needs this stuff now, I'm gonna throw that away and another project comes along and it needs that. And, and Hadoop infrastructure where they're using in multi-tenant Hadoop systems where they're doing analysis and trading those things off. This is happening in enterprises today. It, it absolutely is, but I think that, that, that enterprises don't tend to have the tendency to be able to drive that. I mean, again, some will. I just think that for the, for to, the vast majority of folks. It. What do you mean? Well, I, I think that, that, the, that you don't actually have, there's too much idleness in too many workloads in the enterprise to, to actually justify standing up that much compute. Um, so I think in the limit, a lot of that is gonna move to the operators that can actually, uh, that can actually um, uh, um, get that tendency by, and it may, it may well be that there are companies that are, you know, Bechtel is large enough, Chevron is large enough to stand up their own. Yeah, the, so that's what I'm saying though, is, is you yep. look at the- I have the to take the thing. rubber chicken and, and whack a little bit here because we're, we're actually a little bit over time. Okay. I'd, I'd love <laughs> you to- You do need a rubber chicken. And finally got your <laughs> controversy. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so uh, why don't we try and, um, uh, what I'd like to do is, is see if we can wrap up with just a, a few words of wisdom from each of you, if you think you can muster a few words of wisdom on the spot for, for the folks in the, in the audience. Can you give us more specific topic for our wisdom? Okay, uh, words of wisdom like, about how to get value out of what the cloud and the big data revolutions represent, the opportunities for businesses. So why don't we start at the other end with John, and maybe work this way. Uh, wisdom. Um, so okay, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, I, I would say that certainly it's, it's you're a, creating your own controversy. There, there are um, a lot of really, uh, I guess, you know, I would say exciting young companies that are really doing a lot here. And, and if you have a problem, there's probably three companies out there that are trying to solve it. And many of these companies are, are hungry to work with people on that problem. And that, that so. Assuming that that you know, doing it's a really fun time to do a lot of research and to say, you know, what what kind of systems out there can I do, and interacting with those people. 
So since I come from an analytics company, I'll, I'll come at it from an analytics point of view and say that you know, what you need to be doing and thinking about is what, you know, what can data better enable within your enterprise? What decisions can you be making better? And can your, the people within your, I don't just mean like the CEO of your company be doing better, but what, what, what decisions that are important to what you do either in daily life or in work, can you be doing better if you could data enable those decision make, that decision making? And then start with that, start with the problems and then work back to solutions because increasingly we're able to, to answer those things and help with those decisions. Okay. So I guess since I'm an engineer, I'm going to come at it from a technical perspective around building software. Um, and I'd say that if you want to use the cloud and make the most of it, you have to think about it upfront from how you design your systems and make sure that what you've designed is actually resilient and takes advantage of that sort of stuff. You can't approach software development in the cloud the same way you might in a traditional, these servers are always available situation. Robert? Uh, a lot along the same lines of Kate. Uh, I think you have to realize the cloud, when you go into it, it's a system basically by design, it doesn't want you to actually understand what's going on, right? So just sort of forget about those parts that you cannot see, right? The trying to get into low level, you know, disk and network and those kind of latency issues, like you're just doing it wrong. And the problem is you've probably been taught to do that stuff over the last 10 or 15 years, and that's what makes you actually awesome at your job. Right? But when you get into the cloud, those skills aren't actually useful. So figure out where the new bottlenecks are going to be, because there's definitely ones and there's definitely new problems that you have to solve, and then focus on applying you know, what you've learned in the past to solving those problems. Right. Uh, yeah, I guess my, my, wisdom, my words of wisdom would be to um, be limber of mind um, going forward, that we, we are living in a very exciting time. Um, I think between big data and the cloud, there's a lot of opportunity, no matter where your interest lies in the stack, things are changing, and they're changing in a way that, that's disruptive, and disruptive change is fun. Um, and it means be you a, someone who's interested in developing core technology or using this new technology to go do things that, that were, not, were heretofore impossible. There's a lot of opportunity for all of us, and I think that we all uh, need to avoid the trap uh, of uh, aging technologists. We still haven't settled who the oldest person on the panel is, but the uh, of aging <laughs> technologists where it, 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 it's, it's easy to, to um, believe that, oh, there's nothing to this, so this isn't that interesting, we, we solved all these problems before, this is just a rehash from happened 15 years ago, that's all wrong. And don't fall into that trap. Um, be limber and flexible of mind and see the new opportunity because there's a ton of it out there. Thank you. Everybody give a round of applause and thanks to our <laughs> panelists.